Good evening, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Fresh, Actual, and Live. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be liver disease. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, aspects of liver disease. And the topic of what is liver disease, are you at risk? Um, and I chose this topic because liver disease is a condition that we know a lot about, but we really don't. And uh, what I mean by that is that you know, the common cause of liver disease, if, in fact, if I were to quiz the audience and ask you, okay, what are the common cause of liver disease? Most people would say alcohol consumption. Uh, many people are, are also familiar with hepatitis or other types of infections that could cause liver disease. Uh, some of you are more sophisticated, uh, recognize the fact that uh, medications contribute to liver disease. But, um, you know, as a cardiologist, I see other causes of liver disease. And so, uh, I'd like to talk about liver disease, what it is, uh, the underlying pathophysiology of liver disease, and really talk about how it's much more, much more of a common problem than what we know. So I'd like for you to sit back, get comfortable, and uh, we have a pretty interesting show for you tonight. I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Let's get ready. Okay, welcome back, welcome back. Hello, Catherine, hello, Katie Miller. How are you doing today? I hope you guys uh, had a great Monday. And of course, I hope everybody had a, a wonderful, productive weekend. Um, again, as I said at the outset, we're gonna talk about liver disease, uh, which is an important topic. So what is liver disease, number one, and are you at risk? Um, I deal with many more patients with liver disease than you would imagine. You say, well, liver disease, that's that's a problem for a gastroenterologist. Why is a cardiologist talking about liver disease? Well, uh, that's correct, I'm a cardiologist, uh, but as a cardiologist, many of you know that uh, we have to train in internal medicine, and internal medicine covers all aspects of the human body, gastrointestinal disease and all of those issues. Uh, infectious disease and heart disease and, and endocrinology, um, endocrine diseases. So we have to think about the whole, the body in uh, in its totality. That's one. Two, uh, treating patients with advanced heart disease uh, also encompasses thinking about other organs. Um, patients with advanced heart failure also have can be at risk for renal failure because when the heart starts to fail, it, uh, it has impairment of delivery of oxygen to certain organs. So patients with heart failure can have GI problems, they can have indigestion, uh, malabsorption due to edema in the intestines, uh, they can have um, renal failure, and they can also have liver failure. We call it congestive hepatopathy. Uh, and so I'm going to go through some of these things toward the end of my talk, but I want to talk about liver disease in general, because I do want to give you guys an overview of liver disease uh, from a generic standpoint. But I really want to hone in on two important areas, and I'll, I'll touch base on those uh, as we get uh, through the talk. So uh, part one, we're going to talk about normal liver function. And so as we discuss normal liver function, I'll talk to you about the important things that the liver does uh, and um, the things that we take for granted. So, so what is normal liver function? So what does the liver do? I mean, um, here's the anatomy of the liver. Uh, it sits uh, right uh, on the, if you look at your right upper part of your abdomen, uh, it sits in the right upper part of the abdomen uh, below your diaphragm. Uh, it sits just above the stomach. Um, and also the pancreas sits just below that, um, kind of somewhat beside the stomach. And you have the gallbladder. So many of you have had gallbladder surgery or gallbladder disease. Uh, you know that you may have a scar or scope area in that right upper quadrant area. That's where they go in to take the gallbladder out. And uh, the liver has uh, very complex circulation. 
Uh, it has heart arterial blood flow, so arteries from oxygenated arteries from the heart uh, deliver oxygen uh, and nutrients uh, to the liver. The liver as an organ has to be oxygenated, so those liver cells are oxygenated properly. Uh, but it also has uh, venous flow that goes through it, and this is the blood that travels through the uh, uh, passes through the vein uh, and it, I mean through the liver, and it goes up to the heart, and that's an important. Uh, uh, piece of anatomy. So the blood that comes from your legs, from your abdomen, all the venous return goes up to the heart. It has to pass through the liver. And then you have another uh, vein that we uh, talk about. It's called the portal vein. Now, portal uh, means transport. Uh, and this is the vein that transport uh, nutrient-rich foods, uh, nutrient-rich blood, that is, from the intestines to the liver itself. And that's important. So when you consume something, when you eat you know, bread or toast or, or eat any kind of a meal, uh, you digest that meal. And part of the digestion starts in the mouth, it goes to the stomach, uh, small intestine, uh, and these nutrients are broken down. And they're absorbed in the uh, early parts of the stomach and the small intestine. And the venous return from the, uh, the intestines actually goes to the liver. Why? Because the, the nutrients, which are broken down into their basic components, proteins into amino acids and, and fats into their, their uh, fatty subcomponents, uh, 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 um, carbohydrates are broken into their carbohydrates, different sugars. Uh, these are taken to the liver where they're processed even more. But more so, also, you have other things that you're taking in. Uh, medications and other chemicals and toxins and all of these things. And these things have to go to the liver to be processed. Uh, some things have to be broken down and uh, neutralized. Some, some things that are toxic that's in the bloodstream has to be neutralized in the liver so that it doesn't cause toxicity in the blood. Uh, animal protein, and we're going to talk about that some more, uh, uh, has to be neutralized. So, so there are many things that have to be neutralized. So this portal vein which takes blood from the intestines to the liver uh, is allows for these uh, chemical components to be broken down and in some cases neutralized. Other cases are broken down for the purpose of uh, building proteins and the like. So as I said, located in the right upper quadrant, uh, upper part of the uh, abdominal cavity, so right upper quadrant, uh, it's shaped like a cone. Um, it's uh, dark reddish brown, if you were able to look at it uh, in, in the OR. Uh, and it has two distinct sources of blood, as I mentioned. Uh, oxygenated blood from the hepatic artery and nutrient-rich blood comes from the portal vein. And I also mentioned there's a third source that really passes through, and that's the inferior vena cava and blood flows through the liver uh, and into, uh, into the, the heart on the right side. And uh, that's an important piece of anatomy uh, as we have that. I have one of my colleagues that just checked in. Hey, Dr. Palmer, how are you doing? Hello. Good. We just, uh, we just got into the liver anatomy here. So uh, we're mm -hmm. talking about how um, uh, the liver has important anatomical functions and, and physiology. Uh, let's see, Sandra, let's see, is that a question, Sandra? You mentioned cardiac issues can create GI issues due to lack of blood flow and CHF complicate the resolution of post-operative ileus? Um, uh, the answer, uh, Dylan, is yes. Uh, Sandra is yes. Um, post-operative ileus, um, there are a lot of things that can contribute to post-operative ileus. That's number one. Um, sometimes poor blood flow is a contributing factor. So in the sense of poor blood flow being a problem, it can. Now, other causes of post-operative ileus and perhaps more commonly, is due to scar tissue formation. Uh, oftentimes that's due to inflammation, that's more of a metabolic process. And so sometimes they have to go in and, and release some of the small bowel due to scar tissue. But, but there, are, there could be uh, a, a, a cardiac output or circulatory contri contributing factor to postoperative ileus. And so to that extent it can, but most of the time with postoperative ileus, you have uh, scar tissue formation, or at least most of what we describe as scar tissue formation, and we surgically release that. But great question, great question. We are, they're, um, they're pimping me quite early. 
<laughs> so um, the other thing is so uh, normal liver function. So that's the anatomy. Uh, what what is normal liver function? Uh, let's see. Hold on here. I went the wrong dire direction. Um, the other part of the liver uh, anatomy is that the liver holds about 13% of the blood supply at any given moment. Uh, and that's important because uh, it really implies that the liver is a very vascular uh, structure. Uh, the kidney uh, takes about 25% of the cardiac output of blood flow. So it's also vascular, very vascular, more so than liver. It has to process the blood, but the liver takes a large percentage at a given time because it has to um, metabolize and and to some extent I think of it it's, as I think of the liver in two ways one as a manufacturing organ so it manufactures things it builds proteins uh, from amino acids and things like that and I also think it of it as a processing chemical plant uh, it processes and neutralizes chemicals things that we bring into our, our body and the substance that we consume it processes and neutralizes those things. And those are two important components to think about from the liver. So one, it manufactures things, it builds things, uh, uh, proteins for amino acids, proteins for enzymes, uh, it proteins for, for um, uh, the immune system and the like. Uh, and then it detoxifies, it neutralizes chemicals that can be harmful and and uh, and 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 make them less toxic. So it's a detoxification process. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, it has two main lobes, uh, and you can see here there's a smaller lobe and a larger lobe here. And both lobes have uh, eight segments that consist of a thousand lobules, which are small lobes. And each of these lobes have their own little units of blood blood flow uh, that goes through it. Now. Uh, the liver can regenerate itself. Now, that's an important thing to know. Uh, in fact, they've had situations where uh, someone would donate one of their liver lobes to a loved one, and they, they leave with, be left with a smaller one or donate the small section, and uh, the liver will regenerate itself. And so that's an important component. In fact, the liver may be one of the most forgiving organs that we have. So, and I've seen uh, many individuals who have pretty advanced liver disease turn it around uh, when when they uh, do um, comply uh, strictly with a detox and cleanse. Uh, we've seen lots of liver disease turn around uh, quite well. So it's um, it's it's something to keep in mind. So the regenerative capabilities of the liver is really important. Hello, Fee Bike Girl, how are you doing? So what are the functions? I alluded to that some. Uh, I'll get into that. Uh, there are many functions of the liver. So this list I'm producing is very incomplete. Uh, it produces bile. Bile is responsible for carrying away waste uh, and breaking down fat. So bile is a is a, uh, a, a, a substance that uh, is important for detoxifying. Carrying away waste is detoxifying. Uh, it produces certain proteins. People say, well, you're on a plant-based diet. Where do you get your protein? You get it from the liver. Uh, and so it, it's uh, produced certain proteins, many different proteins. It produces cholesterol, as you know. Uh, many of you have taken statin drugs. You know, the statin drugs were uh, created when they discovered uh, the rate limiting uh, uh, biochemical reaction for the formation of uh, cholesterol. Uh, the coenj uh, coen uh, coenzyme uh, ah, reductase enzyme. Uh, which is a rate limiting enzymatic uh, uh, reaction for the production of cholesterol and statins um, uh, inhibit this enzyme. And that's how they work in terms of reducing LDL cholesterol. Um, it also um, converts excess glucose into glycogen. So the excess amount of glucose, when you consume your carbohydrates, you don't burn all of that glucose. So a healthy liver helps you store that glucose in, into the form of glycogen. But if you have insulin resistance, the glucose doesn't have the ability to take up that excess, excuse me, the liver doesn't have the ability to take up the, up the excess glucose. So uh, you're not able to store glycogen effectively. So again, uh, a normally functioning liver allows you to process those carbohydrates, as you say, and, and put them in the form of storage. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, regulation of blood levels of amino acids is building blocks, okay? 
So it takes in uh, the amino acids, the 10 essential amino acids that you have to uh, uh, bring in. Uh, you can get them from uh, uh, most of your plant sources. These amino acids are taken up and uh, recycled and, and, and allow you to make uh, proteins that are necessary to carry out lots of biochemical functions, such as enzymatic uh, uh, chemical reactions, hormone stability function, vitamin D, uh, processing, stabilization, uh, processes hemoglobin, so it recycles iron. So uh, you, your blood cells have a certain life cycle. And so when those blood cells die, the liver takes the iron from the, the blood the cells that are dying and then recycle them for uh, other blood cells that are used uh, that's made by the uh, bone marrow. So it stores iron. Uh, it converts poisonous ammonia to urea. Now, this is an important component here because I talk to my patients a lot about this. Animal protein consumption um, produces a lots of urea because you have to, the, the animal protein has an ammonia component, uh, a, 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 a nitrogen component that has, that's converted to ammonia that then has to be converted to urea during the metabolic process in the liver. So a normally functioning liver will convert ammonia to urea. And if those of you are familiar with looking at your 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 blood uh, panel, you see a blood test called BUN, is capital B-U-N. And that stands for blood urea nitrogen. And if you've ever gone from an animal protein consuming diet to a plant protein consuming diet, you'll notice that that blood urea nitrogen drops. In fact, the, some of the data we show, show significant 33% reduction in blood urea nitrogen uh, due to the fact that you're consuming less animal protein. Well, the reason that, reason that happens is because there's less of a need to convert ammonia to urea. And so there's less of a need for that. So you have less urea, so your blood urea nitrogen goes down. And so that's something that we see with consuming plant-based uh, disease. So if someone has liver disease, uh, let's say they're an alcoholic, or let's say they have liver disease due to some uh, excess medications, or in the case of patients I have to deal with, uh, they have uh, liver disease due to heart failure. Well, I'll have to remove the animal protein because if I don't, they're going to build up a lot of ammonia. And if the liver is not able to convert that ammonia to urea, then they'll build up ammonia. So the ammonia level goes up and they start to develop some symptoms of, of liver disease, one of which is confusion, uh, disorientation, we call it encephalopathy. Uh, and so that's one of the things. Now, uh, one way that I measure for liver dysfunction, uh, because we typically get what's called liver enzymes, but I will measure albumin level and I'll measure ammonia level and I'll measure anticoagulation levels, PTNINR. Why do I do that? I do that because early on in liver dysfunction, before you can have normal liver enzymes. So most doctors will get uh, liver enzymes. Uh, and if the liver is acutely inflamed, maybe it has an infection or something's acutely injured the liver, then the liver cells will become um, um, in shock. And so they'll leak enzymes. And so we can check liver enzymes and we can see the liver enzymes elevated. However, there are lots of cases where the liver slowly develops dysfunction over time. And so the liver enzymes will not be elevated. And if you're on a chronic medication or some chronic toxin, the liver becomes dysfunctional over time. One way you can measure this liver function is measure um, ammonia level. If the ammonia level is elevated, albumin level is low. Albumin is a major protein. So if the protein is low uh, or if the uh, coagulation numbers are elevated, then that tells me that's a clue that there's some liver dysfunction and we need to start making changes to address that. Uh, Clearing blood of drugs and other poisonous. So I like the way and I got this from, uh, I think, the Mayo Clinic or somewhere, other poisonous substances. So they say this drugs is a poisonous substance, but they are. They're not natural. They're not natural for the body. So they could be considered poisonous substances, even though, you know, we use them for specific reasons uh, to carry out uh, specific beneficial reasons. But drugs are abnormal. Uh, to the body, and so the liver has to process it. So it has to be clear. Uh, it regulates blood clotting. Uh, I'm treating a young lady now who has um, uh, what we call a congestive hepatopathy, but she has a congenital valve disease. So we had to go in and do 
uh, valve uh, repair, her uh, tricuspid valve, and her liver was congested, so she bled. She bleeds very easily, and some of that bleeding uh, problem has improved because uh, we open up that tricuspid valve and relieve some of the pressure from the liver. The liver is working a little better, not perfect, but uh, the bleeding, the blood clotting has improved. It helps resist infections by making immune factors and removing bacteria. The same patient I mentioned uh, has uh, bacteria in the blood because her immune system suppressed because of the liver suppression and, and people with advanced liver disease can get um, uh, liver dysfunction or, or excuse me, infections uh, because the immune system is suppressed. Again, uh, we're here we are in a pandemic, you know, with everyone's, uh, you know, wondering about their immune system. So people with liver dysfunction uh, need to be worried about that. Clearance of bilirubin uh, is an important thing, factor. Uh, if uh, bilirubin's uh, not clear, you can have yellow skin, yellow eyes, and it's one of the symptoms of advanced liver disease is elevated bilirubin and much more. Uh, so far, we've identified about 500 vital functions of the liver, and I'm sure there are probably more that uh, we need to identify. Uh, let's see, Sharon has another question. Let me see here. Uh, surgery was on 422 to remove scar tissue that was causing bowel blocks, upper GI is not functioning yet. Uh, inject, ejection fraction is 30%. Yeah, eject, I mean, it's, it's not always a direct correlation, um, Sandra, but if someone has low cardiac output, and the way I like to think of it is this, if you have low cardiac output, you have poor circulation. So poor circulation um, can impair healing. Uh, whether that healing is due to, you know, post-surgical he healing, et cetera. Uh, and so if you're not able to deliver, uh, let's say, oxygen-rich uh, blood to that site, uh, the metabolic, the necessary metabolic processes, um, you know, may not take uh, place. Uh, you can develop increased inflammation uh, locally due to cytokine buildup and that type of thing. So improved circulation, improved flow, um, uh, has, is one of the factors that, that contribute to that healing process. So a low cardiac output could uh, um, uh, 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 contribute to that. And that's why we like to use a global approach uh, using um, a natural approach, uh, antioxidant diet, et cetera, because it decreases inflammation and oxidation systemically, uh, which means it kind of heals things, it puts out the fire, if you will, but it also improves cardiac function. So you, you're starting to circulate things more. So you're, 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 you're having a benefit in concert. You, you, it's sort of like you got the firemen, the police, you got you know the army, Air Force, Marine, they're all working together to help the body heal itself. And so that's an important, uh, uh, important factor. Uh, so uh, Faye Parker, good evening, everyone. What's, uh, what's out to the garden planting? Some watermelon, oh, wow. Uh, you got to mail some to 10 480 uh, Main Street uh, once that watermelon grows. <laughs> um, anyway, I need to get out and plant some stuff. I, I didn't think it's, it's time to plant watermelon. I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, Faye Parker. Uh, and let's see, what else Faye has to say? Remember giving patients lactulose to help with exertion ammonia in the stools. Don't remember any doctor ever recommending these patients stop eating animal flesh to reduce product of uric acid. Yep. That's true. Uh, we do use la uh, lactulose and it works, uh, but uh, I think it's a superficial treatment. I think we need to treat it at the cause and it, there's a core uh, uh, treatment in terms of reducing uh, the liver function, uh, the ammonia in the liver. Whoops, I have another colleague. Hello, Dr. Atkins, how are you doing? Dr. Pam Atkins, Good, e good e evening. <coughs> my good my evening. background's we are a, little bit, a little dark, but... Um, good yeah, to see you all. Go ahead. Yeah, we can see you quite well, so that's good. Okay, so good. good. Um, so we're getting into liver function. So um, as we go to uh, part two, I want to talk about liver disease. Now, I've gotten into some of the liver disease talking about normal function because I think it, it correlates when you say, okay, here's what it normally does, and if it uh, malfunctions, um, this is what happens. So uh, I want us to take a uh, little bit of a break and when we come back from the break, we're gonna talk about liver disease. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the uh, uh, causes of liver disease in a generic sense and kind of break it down to some specific ones. So let's take a little break and I'll see you later.
All right, welcome back. So part two is liver disease. Um, uh, Chandra's hitting us with these complex questions. So <laughs> uh, iron binding is 392, but iron total is 21 is low and saturations is uh, low. Could this be liver disease? You know, that's a complex issue. There's some bone marrow issues that uh, are related to that. Uh, the answer is that the liver could be contributing to that. Uh, but there, I think there are other factors that are contributing to that as well. So um, I would look at all of your labs, look at liver function, uh, other things that may be contributing. You want to say, okay, if the liver is contributing, could it be some uh, dysfunction in the liver? And if there is some dysfunction in the liver, then yeah, it has to be considered as a contributing factor, even though it's not always clear cut with these ion panels. So let's get into liver disease. So you know, common cause of liver disease, you know, this is just a, you know, generic laundry list of viruses, of genetics, autoimmune disease. Uh, we all know about excess alcohol uh, use, uh, poor diet and obesity. Now that's an important one I want to get into, but medications, street drugs, or toxic chemicals. I, I'm remiss because I didn't have heart failure here. It is on another list later on, uh, but heart failure is, and, and I'm going to argue uh, that Heart failure um, is probably one of the, um, it's probably more common than alcohol. Now, and I'll, I'll get into that argument later. So anyway, uh, other causes of liver disease, acute liver failure, drug overdose, Wilson's disease. Uh, that's a genetic condition associated with copper accumulation, uh, Ray syndrome. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Palmer probably sees a lot of these patients, the kids with viral infections are coming off viral infection or aspirin uh, related uh, conditions. Acute fatty liver in pregnancy, that's rare, seen in the third trimester. And Bud Chiari syndrome is a rare condition where you have blood clot obstruction of um, blood flow from the liver and you can get uh, congestion of the liver. Uh, chronic, now, and these, these, um, uh, titles acute, chronic, are somewhat artificial because there's often a lot of overlap. Uh, but chronic liver failure, alcohol, liver disease, we see this a lot. And it's a cumulative process. Someone drinks too much. Uh, not everybody who, you know, has drinks too much alcohol get liver disease, but uh, it, it is a toxin and non-alcoholic uh, liver disease. And alcohol, by the way, is a direct toxin to the heart. So these people can get heart failure and liver disease. And so that can be a double whammy uh, against the liver. So you can get uh, a cardiomyopathy and direct toxin to the liver. And then the uh, heart failure gives, creates more congestion because the flow into the heart is sluggish and that's put more congestion on the liver so they can get a double whammy. And then non-alcoholic liver disease uh, associated with obesity, type two diabetes and hyperlipidemia. Now we like to give titles. We like to say, oh, you know, type two, this and the other. But I want you to look at these three and lump them together. And it's really a metabolic process. So abnormal metabolism, I'd like to put this, uh, group these as abnormal metabolism contributing to non-alcoholic liver disease. Uh, and this can convert to non-alcoholic um, um, hepatosteatosis, which is we call NASH, uh, steatohepatitosis, excuse me, uh, which is NASH and uh, which is non-alcoholic liver cirrhosis due to non-alcoholic liver disease. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. Combined acute and chronic liver failure, uh, heart failure, there it is. Uh, now that's in red with an asterisk. And uh, I put that there to remind myself to talk about the fact that I think heart failure is a, is a very, it may even be more common in alcohol. The reason I say that is the following. Uh, I see the heart failure is probably the number one cause of morbidity and mortality. And a lot of our heart failure patients have liver dysfunction. LFTs are up and the albumin's low and they have a coagulopathy. And we'll call the GI doctors and they say, yep, that's a congestive hepatopathy. And uh, just treat the heart failure. And that's fine, but they don't go to the liver uh, um, um, lab or clinics and they're not calculated by the liver foundation and, and tallied and all that stuff. So I think a lot of heart failure patients or a lot of patients with liver disease, secondary heart failure, are left out, <coughs> excuse me, of the general tally for liver disease. So when you look at the data, it says, well, the most common cause is uh, alcoholic liver disease, then non-alcoholic, which is metabolic, 
Uh, but I think heart, heart failure, which could fit in this non-alcoholic uh, uh, function, but I think it's more of a special kind is due to hemodynamic problems. Uh, I think it's an important component of liver failure because I see a lot. And in fact, that's one of the impetus, the two major reasons I, I elected to do this talk. One is heart failure. I see so many patients with congestive hepatopathy. Um, I think sometimes I'm acting as a gastroenterologist because I'm, I'm treating patients with liver disease. I'm thinking about their liver enzymes and, and tracking it and adjusting medication accordingly, uh, largely because I'm seeing so many patients with heart failure. Uh, uh, and then of course, hepatitis we know about. There are vaccines for hepatitis. Uh, they're actually drugs that treat hepatitis that's pretty effective. So hepatitis isn't as much of the boogie bear as it used to be, uh, but it's still there. Uh, but the other thing is chronic medication usage. Now, again, that's in red, and I put an asterisk by that. So why did I do that? Now, I think this is a very common cause. It falls under this non-alcoholic liver disease. Now, notice they just said obesity, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, but people that are on chronic medications uh, and, you know, you're on your statins and you're on your, you know, other medications for aches and pains and neuropathies, or maybe you have a little bit of anxiety on something for that. And you're just taking these medications over and over, five of them, 10 of them, 15 of them, and it's constantly metabolized through the liver day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. And what happens is that over time, you start to notice, well, the albumin's a little low, and the ETN INR is a little bit up, et cetera. And then if you hit with an infection, that puts more stress, that puts more acute uh, stress on the liver. So then, or a surgery or something else uh, that causes you to take another medication that has to be metabolized through the liver. So That's over time, liver dies, yes. So also in pediatrics, we do see a bump in uh, liver enzymes, ASCLT, with just Tylenol use. Yep. Um, so it, it does bump, and we tell them that, you know, to stop at that, and it'll come down. And, and see, the ones where you have the bump are the fortunate ones. Yeah. Those are the fortunate ones. The ones who are not fortunate, where you don't see the bump. Because when you don't see the bump, you say, keep taking the Tylenol. Right. You go around for a bump, and 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 um, and I've told this story many times. You know, that's how my mother died. This number red one ninety chronic medication use. In her gastroenterologist never saw the bump. Right. And, uh, well, she, you know, we start right. checking. Well, we check now. We didn't used to check because children didn't typically previously have as much uh, liver dysfunction. But mm -hmm. we're seeing it so much more now that we we check between the ages of like nine and eleven kind of see where they are and the other thing too i mean i i i can't speak to the kid population but i'd be curious to know uh if you were, were to check the ptn inr and albumin levels or ammonia levels if those levels were high and yeah. it would be interesting especially if you have kids who are on a lot of tylenol if you even if the ammonia level gets to the upper limits of normal or the albumin levels on the low side of normal or the ptn inrs if I see just a little bump in the PTNINR, you know, my eyebrows go up because, I mean, you can see these things before you actually see a liver bump. And so, so those of you who are in the uh, chat online looking at this or anybody who looks at this video, if you're on a lot of medication, one, if you're on more than two or three medications, look at your medication and see how the medication metabolizes. That's number one. If you're on two or more medication metabolized through the liver, Ask your doctor about your liver function. Ask your doctor um, uh, to check uh, not only liver enzyme, but check your albumin protein level, check your PT and INR, those are the coagulation. Ask your doctor also to check an ammonia level. Now these things are a little bit extra, but if you're on multiple medications that are metabolized through the liver, then you at least wanna get a spot check of these things. I'm not trying to practice medicine online, but it's just a suggestion. Because <laughs> these things can be very important, especially if you've been on this medication for a long time. Uh, and, and some people can go to any any lab and order these things themselves. So, uh, you know, if your doctor won't check it or if you don't have a doctor you see regularly. So, I, again, um, uh, let's see. Christy Miller says, I wish someone could help Gino Hayes. Ooh. Who's Gino Hayes? I don't know. Somebody famous I don't know. Okay. All right. A picture's worth a thousand words. Um, so a healthy liver can go into um, non-alcoholic liver disease, early uh, liver disease. 
Um, this is a, a, a steatohepatitis hepatitis or inflamed disease. This is where you get some early scarring, this advanced scarring. Now, you know, the diagram is very simplified. It says it's irreversible at this point, irreversible at that point. You know, oftentimes when we get liver biopsies, um, I'm not sure if the liver uh, is destroyed homogeneously. Sometimes it can be. If it's like a congestive hepatopathy, then the liver gets congested uh, uniformly. Uh, you know, some other uh, mechanisms of disease of the liver it may not be a uniform uh, breakdown. So I think this is a gray zone uh, where you could get some reversal. Uh, it's just hard to say. And when you, when you biopsy the liver, you may biopsy one piece that's worse than another or one piece that's not as bad as other parts. And so it gets to be a little, so I, I tend not to give up on anyone. I treat them aggressively and I'll, I'll share what I do later on. But this is liver disease in a nutshell. Again, it's not meant to be an exhaustive um, uh, issue. Uh, okay, Gino Hayes is an NFL player. Uh, what team is Gino? I have to look Gino Hayes up. We got Gino, look at the next is Denver. I mean, look at the next um, Florida State. Florida State player Gino Hayes, hospice care. Oh, okay. Huh. And see, so got liver disease. I guess we'll look that up. Somebody Google that while we uh, that link. It's in the chat and see. Um, Florida State, I have a connection with Florida State, so I will reach out to my connection with Florida State. So uh, here's the issue with the liver disease. Um, uh, what are the symptoms? Uh, liver disease is kind of a real bad disease to have. I mean, uh, it's you have diarrhea, uh, right upper quadrant abdominal pain, confusion, uh, there's fatigue. Uh, buildup of uh, fluid in the abdomen, we call it ascites, a swelling in the abdominal cavity. You see people walk around looking like they're pregnant uh, oftentimes. And, and oftentimes, like the alcoholic men, they're real skinny legs and skinny arms, and their arms have little sores, and it's kind of a, you know, uh, 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 um, metallic, rusty looking uh, discoloration of the skin. And they got this big belly like the pregnant. That's that's a, and they're a little bit jaundiced, some of them. Uh, that's a classic person with liver disease uh, and with the ascites. Uh, vomiting of blood because they develop these uh, esophageal varices of increased pressure of the blood flow because <clears throat> the blood flow through the liver is impaired. The blood flow proximal gets congested. And so you develop these varices. And I've seen some of the most horrible GI bleeds uh, during my internship residency with people with varices and they're very, very difficult to manage. Uh, they feel weak all the time. There's a loss of appetite. Uh, they're nauseated. Uh, they bruise very easily. Their legs are swollen, urine's dark, they're itching. I mean, it's just a horrible, horrible disease to have. Uh, and, um, you know, there's some classic things, Dupuytren's contraction, which, you know, inflammation in joints, um, all these things are, are related to uh, liver disease. And so it's it's really problematic in terms of um, uh, a disease to deal with, and it's a horrible disease uh, for patients uh, to uh, live with. Um, hepatomegaly means enlarged liver uh, because the, the, there's portal hypertension, the spleen gets large, um, the breast hormonal imbalances, you get breast tissue in men. Uh, and so there's a large number of problems that you develop uh, and encephalopathy, as I mentioned, confusion, coma, uh, the liver flap, uh, ataxia. So uh, this is a huge problem, uh, especially when it gets to advanced stages. And uh, it's a problem that we uh, often uh, have. Let's see, Faye Parker. Uh, uh, always wonder what kind of liver disease. Uh, the, yeah, Walter Payton, uh, that's a great, so Walter Payton had um, a rare type is he had a, a biliary disease. So, and I think it was an autoimmune disease. That's a great question. So I don't know if y'all know Walter Payton, uh, sweetness. Mm -hmm. and he was a running back for the um, Chicago Bears. Uh, one of my favorite running backs of all time, you know, Payton and some other guys. But um, he had, like primary sclerosing um, yeah, That's right, primary sclerosing colangitis. So it was, it was an autoimmune biliary disease. 
and um, they didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. I don't want to speculate. And, of course, you know, he's not, not uh, uh, alive now, of course. But, you know, when you get things like that that are autoimmune, uh, that's when you have to detox uh, very aggressively to, to reduce that uh, immune process. And so whatever the triggering mechanism was, it just manifested by attacking the biliary tree. And uh, I'm, we've seen uh, patients with uh, biliary cancer, uh, which now he, uh, to my knowledge, didn't have cancer, just uh, he just had the sclerosis. But, um, but he had um, uh, primary biliary sclerosis of these things can convert to cancer if they, people live long enough, but uh, obviously he didn't uh, survive that. But, but that's a great question. Uh, boy, he's got we got sports fans uh, galore here. You know, uh, it's uh, college football. So part three, we're going to get into treatment. Uh, so I want to take another quick break here, and then uh, we'll get into treatment next. Okay, okay, so I guess we'll look for our next sports quiz. Um, so part three, we're gonna talk about treatment of liver disease. Um, and this is, uh, this is the, uh, well, I guess all is my favorite part, but this is really my favorite part in the sense that, okay, we talked about the problem. So, you know, what are some solutions? Now, what I have here is the standard treatments for advanced liver disease. So basically you pull a textbook or so they Google it online and say, okay, what is the treatment for liver disease? Well, by and large, you treat the primary cause. So in, in this case, uh, antiviral medications, if you have an acute viral infection, uh, you treat the virus and you know suppress the uh, causing agent. Uh, if there's an autoimmune process, autoimmune hepatitis, you wanna suppress the immune system. So people use steroids and the like. Uh, lifestyle choices, now this is important. Now, when I get to our approach, uh, we're going to really lump all these together. Uh, lifestyle uh, choices, um, uh, you know, related to alcohol, obesity. We'll say stop drinking and lose weight. Okay, that's that's pretty specific. <laughs> well, so the stop drinking is pretty specific. I'm not sure about the lose weight part. Uh, I do know that there are. Uh, I've seen a number of very thin patients who come in with non-alcoholic liver disease who don't have obesity or uh, or have um, uh, diabetes. Uh, some of them may have elevated cholesterol, some may not. So it's not just as simple as lose weight. Again, it gets into the mechanism, not just, okay, let's put a Band-Aid on this. Um, and so heart failure management. Many individuals with advanced heart failure will have chronic liver disease. Um, and again, that's the component that I talk about a lot uh, or see a lot. Uh, and the key thing is to improve heart function, but you can't just improve heart function in isolation because you really have to treat the whole body. And, and because whatever you do for the heart, you need to do for the liver almost at the same time. Uh, and so, um, for instance, I, you know, I have patients who have heart failure, they may have atrial fibrillation, then we need to control the atrial fibrillation. Well, okay, with heart failure, there are really only two options for atrial fibrillation. If they have renal disease, the two options are atrial fibrillation or heart failure patients, sotalol and amiodarone, uh, in terms of you know rate control and rhythm control. But then if they have uh, renal disease, I can't use the sotalol because it's renally cleared. So then I'm left with amiodarone. But if they have heart failure and renal dysfunction and liver failure, amiodarone is cleared through the liver. So it's a rock and a hard place. And so sometimes I have to give them amiodarone at a high enough dose, weed it down, cardiovascular sinus rhythm, but then I have to wean off all the other medications and I have to put them on a detox to take anything else that's toxic to the liver out. So if the liver is impaired, uh, yeah, I may have to give them a toxic medication, but that's why I have to be extra diligent in removing other toxins, including the toxins from the food they're consuming. Because if you're consuming processed chemicals, and these processed chemicals can be in vegan food. So it's not like vegan diet. 
is you can have yellow dye number 40 or microwave such and such, which could have a toxic effect on the liver or red dye number 29. So all of these things are processed through the liver and have an adverse effect on liver function. So when you're treating these very complex patients, it's a very slippery slope. And yeah, you may have to give them a drug for a certain period of time to control a problem to help the heart out, but then you have to be very diligent to remove all the other things that can have an adverse effect on the liver. Liver dialysis. Uh, now, <clears throat> liver dialysis is, uh, and I did a little reading on this today because I, I hadn't kept up with it over the years, but uh, to my knowledge, it's not, they hadn't shown any survival benefit for liver dialysis. It's still being done at some institutions. Um, I remember uh, during my residency, there was a patient um, at Bentop Hospital who um, had, uh, who was undergoing liver dialysis. It was very experimental then. That was, gosh, almost 30 years ago. And uh, I mean, she died. She was in her 30s. And she uh, was, uh, she had developed acute liver failure due to, uh, she was being prophylactically treated for uh, uh, tuberculosis, skin reaction. And in, in those days, you have a skin reaction uh, with TB. Uh, you had a negative chest X-ray. You get six, uh, I think it was it six months of isoniazide or something like that. And so um, I think she, but, but she was like in her mid-30s, which is where the risk-benefit ratio gets really narrow. And so unfortunately, she succumbed to that. But that was my uh, only personal experience with liver dialysis. Uh, but it's still being used, but it's not ready for mainstream. Liver transplant is there, and, and people do quite well with liver transplant. My understanding is that uh, once they survive the first year, they tend to do quite well. Um, here's, a here's, a, here's a quiz for the, uh, for the, uh, the people in the chat. Uh, which, uh, y'all get this is too easy, but I'll give it to you anyway. Which actor or actress on the movie, the show, the old sitcom show, Dallas underwent a liver transplant. You got 60 seconds. Answer it in the chat. Which, which, um, and, and you got to name his real name, not his stage name. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, while y'all struggle over that, I'll look at um, Mr. Granville's, uh, uh, you need the real name with the real name. <laughs> um, Otis Graham, so what caused uh, amylase uh, uh, number in the liver uh, to go up? Let's see. Larry Hagman. Okay. Somebody got it. Yeah, amylase is an enzyme for the pancreas. Uh, amylase and lipase. So those are pancreatic enzymes. Uh, now, the liver indirectly can, can contribute to that because you can develop gallstones and you can have a gallstone pancreatitis. And so you can develop amylase, but it's, it's usually due to inflammation in the pancreas. I'm sorry, Dr. Palmer, uh, Dr. Atkins, y'all gonna say something? No, I, I, I was trying to think of, I was gonna say JR, but uh, but uh, somebody got the answer, okay. Yeah, yeah, JR, yeah, this <laughs> real name is very happy. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. I, only the old uh, school people will remember that, you know. The younger people, yeah. have no doubt. <laughs> well, what, which which other show? I, yeah, it's Dallas. Yeah, he also played <laughs> on the I Dream of Genie. I was gonna say which other show, but he probably played lots of shows. I Dream yes. of Genie is also a show he played uh -huh. on. But anyway, all right. So we got so supplements for the liver. Now, you know, we all talk about supplements, and and this um, uh, health series came out of our the context of uh, talking about supplements. And so I thought I'd just go run through some supplements uh, that uh, are touted as uh, beneficial to the liver. And, and again, Dr. Palmer and Atkins, please feel free to chime in here. Uh, milk thistle, an antioxidant, uh, has antioxidant called um, silmarin. Uh, it helps with uh, optimizing liver function and detoxification. Uh, artichoke leaf helps with the production of bile, which uh, again, uh, detoxifies the body. Uh, turmeric root uh, has polyphenols, reduces uh, fatty liver. Uh, and um, dandelion root helps in uh, the, the liver remove toxins and increase bile production. Uh, yellow dock root, it stimulates lymphatic system, 
So it, it really uh, detoxifies the body systemically uh, and uh, it, it, the lymphatic tissue pulls toxin out of the interstitial tissue. And so that removes toxin and waste out like the garbage uh, trucks. Uh, beetroot, high fiber content and trace minerals and beetroot um, uh, helps with moving the waste from the liver. Uh, ginger has anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, and generally anything has anti-inflammatory properties can help with healing. Uh, choline is a component of fat, it helps prevent toxic buildup in the liver. Uh, molybdenum is a nutrient that acts like a catalyst for enzymes that break down amino acids. And selenium, which is found in soil in Brazil, Brazil nuts, uh, is required for the formation of peroxidase and uh, theroxidase reductase. And these are two glutathione peroxidase. And these are two enzymes that are important for cellular metabolism uh, and production of other um, uh, antioxidant properties as well. So, you know, here you have, you know, a number of um, superfoods, if you will, that benefit. Now, I imagine people may buy these in capsules or, you know, other kinds of tinctures, et cetera. Uh, but one could argue to eat the whole food. Uh, and my argument is that uh, the first step in detox is to not tox. And so when I, uh, when I put someone on liver cleanse, I start off by removing a lot of stuff from their diet. And it doesn't mean that I don't use any of these because, you know, components of these nutrients are in a lot of the foods that, that I may recommend. Um, but um, it's not necessary that you have to use these, but, but these are just, I wanted to give some level of completeness uh, for this. And so that's why I uh, uh, just threw this up here. So and also we, you, um, we can refer back to a previous lecture, but the bitters, Oh, yes. Yeah. Bitter foods also help with liver detox. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Bitter foods. Uh, Patrice, a tea is good for liver uh, health and ingredients such as green tea, lemon peel, turmeric, peppermint, beetroot, chicory, lemongrass. Well, beetroot is in a list. Um, Dr. Atkins, uh, green tea, lemon peel, peppermint. Are they, do you use any of those? Yeah. Your yeah, all those ingredients are, are good ingredients. I just remind people that teas are the weakest form of some of the herbal products. So, um, but uh, extracts or tinctures are stronger or capsules. So when you're doing a tea, just to know it's a weaker form, but it can be a beneficial herb. And um, so, um, but something like milk thistle you know is a good you know, all these all these herbs are good and sometimes you know taking a capsule may be like taking so many pounds of it you know which we won't probably get in our normal diet but um uh, our artichoke is great for selenium uh, as well you know as the food but yes but just to know these are a weaker form so i don't think of them as therapeutic usually therapeutic uh, with the, a few exceptions. And then the grounded asparagus someone mentioned here. Um, asparagus. Uh, asparagus, yes. Asparagus. Yeah. asparagus, that's what I meant, not asparagus, yes. All right, so uh, what do I do when I see patients? Well, obviously I've kind of given away uh, my biases. And, 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 I, and when I talk about my approach, my a good majority of my patients are those two categories I had in red, heart failure and chronic medication use. And so um, oftentimes by simply treating the underlying cause, um, we're treating uh, the liver disease. So that's, I want to say that because I don't want to say, okay, well, this is the only way to do it. Although I think, you know, nutritional detox should be at the foundation of treating any chronic illness or acute illness. Um, but, but I do want to preface it by saying that uh, my patients are in the context of heart failure patients or, and or patients on multiple medications over a long period of time. Uh, but we start everyone on a nutritional detox, and depending on how severe the liver disease is, uh, the more aggressive we become. So food level 0 to 4B, that's raw up to dehydrated foods. Uh, we use a lot of superfoods, uh, algae, uh, super green sprouts, uh, cold-pressed juices. Sometimes I may put someone on a juice feast. Um, uh, especially with vegetable juices, if they have severe liver dysfunction, to rest the GI tract, 
remove inflammation, uh, take away the burden of, of, um, of the liver um, um, a detox. And also, by the way, the nutritional detox allows us to remove medication. So if someone's on something for blood sugar, they may be on two or three agents for blood sugar that's metabolized by the liver, as well as a statin drug or whatever the case is. When I put them on detox, then I can rapidly wean off those medications. So that allows me to uh, 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 improve the liver, not only directly through the mechanism of the superfoods, the nutrients that they're bringing in, but also uh, direct or indirect, if you will, by means of removing offending agents or co-offending agents. And so a detox as a foundation is very beneficial because if you can take someone off one or two blood pressure medication, one or two uh, cholesterol medication, or diabetes medication, that has a huge impact uh, on the liver, regardless of the underlying cause. Because if somebody has uh, liver failure due to heart failure, but also on medications that has to be metabolized by the liver, it's almost like getting beat up by two, three different people. So if you're, you know, you're in a street fight and you got three people beating you up, you know, if, if I'm out in the street, three people beating me up, if, you know, Celeste and Pam can come pull two or three of them off, I might have a chance. But, you know, <laughs> still getting whooped by three people, then, you know, it makes it more difficult. Uh, yes, supplements, but I use supplements in a less targeted fashion, more of a global fashion, MSM, liposomal C, so I use uh, global antioxidants. It doesn't mean I wouldn't use a milk thistle or any of these things on a target, but those will come later uh, if I don't see response in this early approach uh, with nutritional detox and the like. And then fresh air and sunshine. Again, you know, we, we, we talk about these things, but you know, I'm, I'm having more patients. We, we have, we've developed an exercise, uh, a, a medical supervised exercise program at the office and, and a number of patients are getting out, taking the shoes off and working out, getting fresh air and sunshine. And they're seeing amazing benefits, you know, mobility improvement, et cetera, uh, grounding and earthing. Again, it has an antioxidant effect. Uh, and so we're, we're activating all of these things in our patients. And this is part of the regimen for liver disease. And of course, outdoor exercise, uh, movement, uh, improving cardiac output and the like. So, you know, we try to put all these things uh, together. Uh, also, getting people out of the house uh, makes a difference uh, in their overall well being. Uh, there's a patient uh, we were treating recently who's in the hospital, it's in stage heart failure. I think I mentioned her a week or two ago. And, uh, you know, she was given up uh, for dead by many of my colleagues. And so we detoxed her, uh, started food levels zero to four B. Uh, she had some congestive hepatopathy. Uh, and uh, we were able to wean her off milrinone, which is a medicine, an IV medicine given to heart failure patient in stage. She was able to wean off of this. She did stay in the nursing home, but, but a day and a half or two went home. Uh, I saw in the office within a week of leaving the hospital and she was just dancing in the exam room. And so, you know, we're getting her out and about fresh air, sunshine. It helps improve the mood uh, as well as have these biochemical effects uh, on on the on their condition. So anyway, thanks, guys, for your questions and, and uh, input. Uh, I will open the floor for more questions as we round up the last few minutes. Uh, Sandra has some. So, OK, so I have several paragoglumia liver mets throughout my lobes and my liver. My liver function is good. I have fatty liver disease and the size of a liver cyst. I want to optimize our liver health without uh, instigating tumor growth. And the nutritional detox safe defies the presence of this liver to mets. Um, you know, I don't want to speak in terms of a the specific disease. <clears throat> it would be good for me to see you personally. What, what I will say in general, generically speaking, is that a nutritional detox helps globally. So without saying, okay, a nutritional detox is a uh, you know treatment for paraganglioma liver mets, uh, I will say that you know uh, a nutritional detox enhances the body's overall health. And so it could be a direct or indirect uh, effect on you know your paraganglioma liver mets. Uh, but but it would be something I would rather address you know in the office uh, with somebody with this. But but again, I have not seen a patient that has not benefited from optimal nutrition, uh, regardless of the disease state, because optimal nutrition allows the body to uh, treat itself and uh, protect itself and heal itself. So I'll, I'll say that. Any other comments on that? Yeah. 
I, um, I agree that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, you need to know more information. It's hard, but you can't underestimate the power of the, the diet, a good, clean diet, because having that fatty liver and having liver disease, uh, it's contributed. I mean, especially fatty liver, but it's more complicated. I can't, you know, it's not just being obese, but it's... Uh, fast food, it is sodas, high fructose corn syrup, and sweet drinks, and processed fast foods are really causing it to be so high. I don't know if you mentioned it, but it's like 25% of the population is randomly, they, we find out they have fatty liver. I oftentimes will find it on an ultrasound of the abdomen. So I just, you can't underemphasize how important a diet is. And many times it is reversible, but if it's not, if we don't change these uh, lifestyle and dietary changes, we, it can go on to cause a cirrhosis and liver failure. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. And I didn't really emphasize the fast food point, which I think is important, uh, but you're exactly right because a lot of people consume these fast foods and, and and a lot of the slow food is fast and they're consuming a lot of these things with lots of uh, chemicals and preservatives and the like. And, and, and like I say, okay, 25% of the people have fatty liver, but you know, Hey, um, it could be more than that because, you know, we're not screening everybody and, and, and then how sensitive are our screening tools, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, most most of our colleagues just get liver enzymes and say, okay, the liver enzymes are normal, so go on about your business. In fact, I saw a patient that had fatty liver on imaging, but then enzymes are normal. They said, well, my GI doctor said that uh, this reading is wrong. It's nothing wrong with my liver. But no, the liver, <laughs> you have fatty liver, even though it's not acutely inflamed. And so I think if we look at our lifestyle, we probably can imagine that if people, you know, maybe we should calculate the, instead of using ultrasounds and blood tests, we should go in and, and use the plate. I, I used to have a talk where I say, oh, here's the diagnostic tool of the future. It's the meal plate. Maybe we should go and grab the meal plates. And so, you know, what percentage of meal plates have, you know, dead animal flesh and junk food? Well, if it's 80%, that's the percentage of liver disease you have. Because <laughs> it starts with the meal plate. We have to also remember that um, same thing happens with children. Children also get um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and the, and the incidence is increasing um, in the United States between the ages of two and 19. So, and children are also getting liver transplant. Um, I have a couple of patients who are transplant patients. So, um, you know, some of it's diet, obviously, we talked about diet. Some of it can be from other reasons, but we know that children are eating a lot of fast food um, and processed foods. So um, you can't forget that it's not okay to let the children have a buffet of whatever they want because they're children, because we are creating a problem. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's, you know, we, we have that attitude, well, they can run it off, but you can't run off poison. And, and we're starting to learn that. And it's, it's, a, it's a real, it's a real problem. Uh, Dr. Atkins, let's see, one to ask Dr. Atkins, I'm thinking tinctures are made with alcohol. What about extracts? I guess in terms of those uh, nutrients. So uh, she wants to know what you think about extracts versus tinctures. Because tinctures yeah, are made uh, with alcohol. Do you like extracts more than tinctures or? Uh, you know, you look at the concentration of them. Um, 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 some products that are, yeah, a lot of extracts are in alcohol, but it may say 25 or 30 percent alcohol, but it's a very small amount when you're doing the drops. So generally, it's more helpful than harm. It's not like drinking a, a four or eight ounce glass of alcohol. But uh, and, and tinctures can be helpful too. You just look at the concentration to see um, what you're getting. All right, somebody completed a 20-day detox, and this must be the baseline heart attack risk. I want to wait for the after. Yeah, I always wait for the after laps because that's baseline. Uh, the after can be lower, so uh, wait for the after because you may have done some good uh, in the after in the after effect. Well, these are great questions. I, I enjoyed the comments and the audience participation. And again, it's a very important topic. The liver 
is something that, you know, we deal with labels so much uh, in our practice or in the practice of medicine. And, but we don't think of a broad scope of, you know, pathophysiological processes. And when you think about it, you know, liver disease, even though we say, okay, heart disease, number one chance and so on, but a lot of these things starts in the GI tract. I mean, so the intestine, the liver, whether you're talking about the microbiome or the metabolic process of the liver, et cetera. So a lot of these heart disease, kidney disease, these things are you know, often related to an abnormal um, uh, biochemical milieu. And so that really sets the stage for things. And as Dr. Palmer said off, you know, our kids are, are starting off with an abnormal biochemical milieu and they're eating junk food. And as they get older, the microbiome is terrible and all of that. And so the body has gone through this chronic toxic waste environment. And so it, it, it doesn't, shouldn't surprise us that, you know, at the age 20, 30, 40, or 50, they have advanced, you know, heart disease or liver disease or the like. Uh, and I've had a number of patients come in and say with heart disease, uh, one patient I lost not too long ago, he said, well, look, you know, you know, I was fine. I was eating bad food and all this other stuff, but you know, he was eating trash food for a long time. And, you know, he had heart failure for 10 years. And then, of course, by the time he got to us, he had advanced heart failure and was on that slippery slope. Uh, and and he was just mystified. So, wait a minute. You know, I was fine until, you know, a few weeks ago, a month ago. Well, you really weren't. You just asymptomatic until a few weeks ago, a month ago. And so, you know, you have to look at all of these things. So anyway, any other comments before we close out? All right. So I will see you guys backstage as I close out. Thank you very much. All right. As um, we close out today, I want to leave you with the comments. And again, you know, um, we hope you found this to be helpful material. Uh, please share this information with loved ones, or friends, or even enemies, or anybody you think who can benefit from this information. Uh, it's important information, uh, but what we try to do is always empower you with the knowledge and information so that you can make the best choices to take control of your health. Um, you know, it's your body, it's your health, it's your life. Uh, no one's going to be lying in that, you know, ICU bed, you know, but you or hospital bed or taking those medications. So take charge, take this information, you know, read as much as you can. Um, and uh, of course, join us on other shows, send questions through the chat. Uh, our purpose here is to em empower you with knowledge and information. Uh, if you found this uh, information be useful, please subscribe, hit the thumbs up button. Of course, it helps with our, our um, uh, algorithm. And uh, of course, uh, share this information with anyone uh, that could benefit. Until next time, We'd like for you to keep it fresh, natural, and live.